This is a mechanism of disease map for cholinergic crisis. This is the same thing as organophosphate poisoning, and we'll be talking about that and the many manifestations of this toxidrome. As in all of these flowcharts, each of these boxes is color-coded according to the legend that you see here at the top right. And we'll be starting off with the central tenant of cholinergic crisis, the problem of having too many acetylcholine receptors activated, working our way back to the etiologies, discussing the varied etiologies, the more common ones, and how to identify them, then talking about the manifestations, and then we'll give some tips for management of cholinergic crisis at the end. So let's get started. As we said, at the center of cholinergic crisis is activation of acetylcholine receptors much more than you normally would. Now remember, acetylcholine receptors include both muscarinic and nicotinic receptors, and when you activate these, you have overactivation of the parasympathetic nervous system. So <clears throat> you'll have a lot of fluids coming out of the body, and we'll kind of notice that when we talk about the manifestations in just a little bit. Now this usually happens through irreversible inhibition of acetylcholine esterase. Remember, acetylcholine esterase is the enzyme that breaks down acetylcholine. So when you don't have that, you're, breaking, you're not breaking down acetylcholine, you'll have way too much. You'll have higher acetylcholine levels, and that's what leads to overactivation of the acetylcholine receptors. Now, what exactly causes irreversible inhibition of acetylcholine esterase inhibitors? The prompt you'll typically see on like a board exam or maybe in the clinic or maybe in the emergency room is exposure to organophosphate insecticides. This includes Parethion and E605. And the typical picture will be a farmer or a field worker who was out in the field um, spreading out the insecticide, the pesticides, and then they're exposed to this organophosphate way too much and they end up with all of the symptoms that we're about to talk about. Now this chemical in particular, Parethion, has a garlic-like or petrol-like odor, so that might help you identify it. They also add a blue dye to it during its formulation, so that blue dye stains the mucosa and stains the patient's saliva, so that might be another hint. Um, if you have a farmer with blue lips or blue mouth or blue saliva with a garlic-like odor, you can um, almost pretty safely assume uh, that it's insecticide poisoning. Another cause of acetylcholine esterase inhibition is exposure to nerve agents. This includes sarin, VX, and Novichok agents. And these are typically more seen in a military or war setting. These are odorless, tasteless agents, so you won't be able to identify them like you could the parethion. Other things cause inhibition of acetylcholine esterase. You can actually take medications that do this intentionally. And if you take an excess dose of those medications, like an excess dose of cholinesterase inhibitors, you can also have these symptoms. You can also have this toxidrome. There are two cases that are worth knowing that match this scenario. People with myasthenias gravis, they take peridostigmine for management of their symptoms, and if they take too much of that, if they overdose on that, they can have a cholinergic crisis. They can go into the cholinergic toxidrome. In addition, in a more iatrogenic setting, following general anesthetic, we use neostigmine to reverse neuromuscular blockade. If you give a much higher dose of neostigmine than what's warranted for the patient's body weight, they can also get an excess dose of um, neostigmine, which is a cholinesterase inhibitor, which can also lead to this cholinergic toxidrome. So those are two other causes that you might see related to medicine and drugs. This one's less common. There's a poisonous fungi that contains muscarine. This is the inocybe and clitocybe um, genuses of, mu of, of, mus of fungi, and um, they also cause the same process. They can also cause a cholinergic crisis. Less common um, is nicotine poisoning. This one would directly go to here because it doesn't affect your acetylcholine esterase levels, um, but it would di directly affect the nicotinic receptor. And this might be a case of like a child eating a cigarette or like a young toddler swallowing too many cigarette butts or something like that. They can get nicotinic poisoning and have some of these manifestations. It won't be all the manifestations because again, you only have the nicotinic receptor activated, not the muscarinic and the nicotinic, but you can still have some. Now let's talk about the manifestations. The easy mnemonic to remember the manifestations is dumbbells. So um, when you have parasympathetic system overactivation, you get diarrhea, you get urination, you get meiosis, or like pinpoint pupils, um, strong pupil constriction, bronchospasm, bradycardia, emesis or vomiting, lacrimation or tearing of the eyes, lethargy, sweating, and salivation. 
Now, you'll notice that a lot of these are fluids coming out of the body. So um, diarrhea, fluid coming out of your GI tract. Urination, you're peeing a lot, fluid coming out of your GU tract. Um, we have another one later that'll be bronchorrhea. So you'll have fluid coming out of your lungs. You're vomiting, so it, uh, coming out of the other end of your GI tract. Lacrimation, so um, sweating and salivation. You just have fluids coming out of all of your orifices. So if you see a farmer that has vomit on his shirt, urine on his pants, diarrhea in his pants, just fluids everywhere, think cholinergic crisis. It also has some neuromuscular symptoms, um, of course, because acetylcholine is important at the neuromuscular junction. So you can have muscular fasciculations, weakness, spasms, and paralysis. And here's the bronchorrhea I mentioned, yet another um, fluid coming out of the body symptom. Now, the, these are all pretty serious, but the most serious that you can end up with is respiratory failure. This is what puts the patient at greatest danger for their life. And there are a lot of things that contribute to this. You can have all this neuromuscular weakness that makes it harder for the patient to actually breathe. You can have bronchospasm and wheezing, which makes them harder for, the, for them to get air in. And of course, bronchorrhea just can cause aspiration, can um, get all these fluids inside the lung as well. So respiratory failure is the greatest danger for people in a cholinergic crisis. And when we discuss management in just a minute or so, we'll see that that's the first thing you want to secure, the first thing you, that you want to make sure is okay. Lastly, some more severe symptoms of cholinergic crisis. Patient can have hypotension, seizures, and coma in very severe cases. Okay, so now let's talk about management. First thing you wanna do is secure the airway and give oxygen if the patient needs it. Um, always follow the ABCs in um, case of a crisis, and cholinergic crisis is no different. You can also decontaminate the patient if they've been exposed to these things. For instance, if they have a nerve agent, God forbid, on their clothes or um, in their hair or something, you want to like make sure you get all that out. Um, same with the organophosphate poisoning. If they still have that insecticide or that pesticide on their clothes, on their pants, or next to them, you want to clear them. Um, and make sure you use PPE for yourself when you do that, because as a medical worker, you don't want to um, injure yourself in the process of helping your patient. Next, you can think about some medications to help um, reverse this toxidrome, to reverse this crisis. Atropine is the first one you wanna start with. This is a competitive agonist at the muscarinic receptor, so it'll directly block um, acetylcholine's effect at that receptor. Next, you wanna do the pralidoxime. This is part of the oxime group of drugs, and these regenerate acetylcholine esterase by dephosphorylation. So what happens when um, acetylcholine esterase is inhibited is that you add a phosphate group somewhere where it shouldn't be, and uh, the pralidoxime removes that phosphate group. It dephosphorylates, so it kind of regenerates your acetylcholine esterase, which then goes back to break down the acetylcholine and kind of return your acetylcholine to normal levels. You always want to give atropine first before pralidoxime, so that's something to remember. Uh, airways, decontaminate, atropine, then pralidoxime. You can also do a couple other medications for some of the symptoms specifically. Um, you can, um, for instance, give benzodiazepines if the patient is having seizures induced by this cholinergic crisis. I hope this review of cholinergic crisis was helpful, and thank you for listening.